welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff, and today with us, a fascinating guest. His name, Gianni Russo. He's an actor and a singer. Many of you remember Gianni for his role in The Godfather back in 1972. Let's all welcome Gianni Russo. Gianni, it's so nice to have you with us. And Gianni, can you talk a little bit about your role as Carlos in the movie The Godfather? What was that like back then? Well, it was amazing. I was uh, 25 years of age. First of all, I want to thank you for having me on the show. And uh, to get back to your question, I was 25. I was an egomaniac, had a ton of money, and I wanted to be a movie actor. So I had and how did you get in? Well, someone read me the book. And because uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, scholastically uh, empowered because I didn't go to school, which we'll get into later. But um, with that said, I waited for the opportunity when Joe Colombo started picketing the FBI building and because he thought the book, The Godfather, showed the Italians in the wrong light. And I, I knew the mob people enough. I was around them all of my life. And I knew it was always about money. So when I approached Joe, I said, Joe, you know, you can make a lot of money with this. And I know you just hired Barry Schlotnick to, to represent the league, the Italian Defamation League. I said, I, I think we can make money. He said, how are you going to make money? I said, well, if you give me the permission, I'll go talk to Paramount for you. And I think, you know, if you let them shoot it, we can make this into a, a really a, a, a big fundraiser for the league. And he said, how are you going to do that? I said, well, Let's take out of the script what's bothering you. We'll have Barry read it. And then if they agree to take out certain words and phrases, you want the world premiere in every major city in the country. And he loved it. And he said, can you do that? I said, I don't know. I'm waiting for permission from you to go see if we could do it. So Yes, well, I remember the book and I remember the movie and... And it was a huge hit. And oh my God, I remember you too in the movie. <laughs> well, well, Carlos is a hard guy to forget, especially beating up a pregnant woman. And the, and the father is Don Corleone. So you don't forget this guy. But, yes, uh, and I understand Marlon Brando did not want you in the movie. Yeah, Marlon, I mean, I, I, we became friends after that. I remember getting my first call sheet in my life, which I never knew what that was. And I'm sure most of the audience doesn't. This is the sheet you get the night before that tells you what you're doing the next day. And this was for a rehearsal on 119th Street. And I used to be up on Patsy's on 119th Street in Harlem all the time. So I knew the area well. In fact, I got there earlier and they said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here for the rehearsal. I said, they said, for The Godfather? I said, yeah. They said, what are you gonna do in that movie? I said, Carlo. And they all thought I was lying. Is how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. I got the part. So with that said, I went into the room. And in the call, the bottom of the call sheet, it said, do not have eye contact with Marlon Brando. Do not talk to him. And I said, no, I have no problem with that. So the first break, he came over to me. And he said, you're a big TV actor. I said, no. He says, um, you're not on Broadway. I know everybody on Broadway. I said, you're right again. He said, who'd you study with? I said, what are you talking about, study? And with that, he called Coppola over. He said, Francis, this guy's playing my son. And Francis had no say in it. He didn't cast me. He said, I know. I said, and I didn't know protocol on the set. I was never on a set before. He said, I could see where this guy was going, meaning Marlon Brando. I said, Marlon, I mean, Francis, can you go over there a minute? I want to talk to Marlon privately. Now, I didn't know you can't dismiss the director even in a rehearsal. So once I did that, the whole room got silent because they didn't know who I was. I was wearing Brioni and they were wearing combat boots and fatigues. <laughs> so they said, don't talk to him. I did a sacrilege. I put my arm around him and I walked him into the back of the club because I knew where the zig and neck game was at night. And I knew there was no game going on at that time. So I went back there because I didn't want to embarrass the guy. And I got nose to nose to him. I said, let me tell you something, Mr. Brando. At all due respect, I know who you are, but you get me fired. Listen to what I'm about to say. You get me fired, I will suck on your heart. You will bleed out right here. 
with this. Oh, well, you wanted that part and you, <laughs> you kept that part, right? Well, not only that, he stepped back. I didn't know whether he was going to call a cop or what. He said, that was brilliant. You could do that. <laughs> good so for that the was movie. Acting. I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, good for the movie anyway, and we can leave it at that. Yeah. Now, you started off at a very young age living on your own. And one of the big stories about you is your relationship with Marilyn Monroe. And as it goes, I understand you had a very intimate relationship with her. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And then, of course, we're get a, going to get on to the topic of philanthropy. But I'd like to hear a little bit about your beginnings and your beginnings with Marilyn Monroe. Well, my beginnings, were I got polio. This is my second pandemic. I got polio August 7th, 1949. And they quarantined me in Bellevue State Hospital which was, you know, 20 blocks from my house. And um, I didn't know what the word quarantine meant at six and a half years of age. And I soon found out there was nobody coming. And um, I was there five years, like you said. And then when I got out, finally, I was living off the streets. I was just so mad at my family, not knowing why they didn't come and see me or whatever. And I went back to the neighborhood and I was working at Magnati's Bakery at night and sleeping there. And then during the day, I came up with this idea to sell ballpoint pens. They just came out. And I came uptown. I can remember taking the N train and got off of 59th Street and, and 5th Avenue. And I made that my home for a few months in front of the Sherry Netherlands. And every day this guy would come by and give me words of wisdom, pat me on my left shoulder, and never took a pen, but give me two or three dollars, sometimes five dollars, mm -hmm. only to find out later on he was Frank Costello. So I worked for Costello for a long time, a couple of years, and then I got caught on the streets by a truant mm -hmm. officer. And he said, why aren't you in school? I was laughing. I had like a thousand dollars in my pocket running errands for this guy. I said, I don't go to school. He said, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 16, I mean 15, 15 and a half actually. He's well in New York, you gotta to go to school till you're 16. So he writes me a ticket. I was on my way to Tut Shaw on the west side. So I walk into the bar and there was Costello, Joe Maggio, everybody was in that place. I hung out there all day long. And he sees the ticket. He said, what'd you get a ticket for walking past? And he looked at it and it was for being a truant. So he said, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 15 and a half. He said, well, I'll fix this for you. And when he did, he put me in Wilford Academy on 52nd Street and, and on top of Lindy's and Broadway, which was a hairdressing school. And at first I was very said, well, I want to go to no hairdressing school. He's just stayed there for six months. And then when you're done, you're done. He's been, I fixed it. You just go there in the morning, sign in and walk out. Well, the first morning I went there, it was 20 or 30 good looking girls. Where are you going to find 20 or 30 girls at 9.30 <laughs> in the morning in New York? So I went every day until 11 when I go meet him. And that's then one day, Kenneth, I'm giving you the fast version. Kenneth of, uh, of Kenneth and Mark Sinclair, the famous hairdressers. In fact, uh, Remember. Jack, yeah. And Jackie O, I mean, at that time, I mean, Jackie Kennedy, she gave him the shop, Kenneth. But they were at Lily Dashay. And they needed shampoo boys. And they picked me because I was a cute little kid. I think they had, they thought they were going to have their way with me. <laughs> and with that said, the fourth had a hair. I go into the shampoo room. They had rooms. It was such a high-end uh, salon. And uh, it was Marilyn Monroe. I had laid back in the basin looking at this, the ceiling. And I, don't <laughs> know how, I don't know how long I was looking at her. But she finally said, there's someone in the room. I said, excuse me. Yeah. And then I walked over and I got her chart and you know, with the, the temperature of the water and I had to test it on the inside of her wrist for her approval. And she liked a hard massage, it said. So I'm, I can't believe in the one I'm washing Marilyn Monroe's hair. I've seen something like it on 10 times already at the Paramount where I was sleeping at night. So I stopped massaging her hair and she's moaning like we're being intimate with each other. And more she's moaning, the more aroused I'm getting. 
And now I got a towel dry our hair and walk it to the station. And I'm aroused. I want to keep it clean. And I'm trying to hide behind her walking through the casino. I mean, the, the salon. And from that point on, she started recommending me. <laughs> and uh, I mean, asking for me. And one day, Costello was leaving to go fishing on the weekend. And he said, we have a guest at the Waldorf, which he did all the time. I want you to look in on her. So I went there at 12 o'clock and it was Marilyn Monroe. And she said, Johnny, what are you doing here? I said, well, Mr. C told me to look in. I didn't know it was you. So come on in. I just got room service. And I didn't know what room service was. She had all these food carts and she was in a terry cloth robe. And she said, have some breakfast. I said, I already had it. Thank you. She said, well, have some champagne. I said, I can't drink. I'm underage. And she started laughing with that. Not laughing, that giggle she used to have. So all I could say is I, that was a Saturday afternoon and I left Monday morning which is all in my book, Hollywood Godfather. Yes, now, so you were a homeless child, really, and- well, I had a home, I just didn't want to go to it. <laughs> no, I was so, no, I had a home. I could have went to my aunt's house, my grandmother's house. I was just so independent at that time. And I mean, you do five years in an institution like Bellevue, because most of the people there are crazy and you're hearing screaming all night long. I'm a kid that I'm watching kids die. I watched 2,300 kids die there because of polio and during that experiment of the vaccine. And uh, you come out pretty callous. And I, I just, you know, I was confused. And fortunately, Costello basically was my father image from that point on until 73, until he died. I'm in his apartment in New York right now. Now, you've been a very prolific actor. You've been in many, many, many movies, about 42, I think. And yeah. you've really created a career for yourself in the world of acting. And I understand you've also done a lot in the way of philanthropy. And you've had a, a, a very, um, well, a, a, an unusual background for a philanthropist. But I want you to talk a little bit about what you've done for the St. Francis Food Pantry. I read a little bit about that and some of the other work you've done because people, people look at you, they think of your acting, they think of your involvement maybe with Costello, with Marilyn Monroe, but they don't know the other side of who Gianni Russo is. Well, how that came about is I made an OV. I'm still very religious. All my the house in my, I have I, has altars in it. I made a dedication to St. Anthony early on. So I made a novena. If I ever got out and ever was successful, I would take care of kids and, and people who needed it like I did. And that's why when you touch on homeless, yes, I was homeless, but I had money. I mean, Costello, every time he saw me, gave me a hundred dollar bill, which is like a thousand dollars in the fifties. But I got involved, my first charity was for special children, Down's children. And I talked Paramount into giving me the world premiere on Staten Island, which I created my first home for Down syndrome. And I created three others since then. And that was my big charity for about 40 years. I still was involved with the Jerry Lewis telethon and all that. And then when I came here, I met John Casamitis and some other people, and they were very involved in the St. Francis Food Pantry. And Joe Sato, who I got to learn and love. And I raised a lot of money. As you can see behind me, my dining room sits 16. And I do charity dinners where people bid to come here for a five-course dinner that I cook. And we tell stories, go through my memorabilia. And 100% of the money goes to them. And they honored me a year or two ago at Chelsea Pier, which I was amazed, actually. And uh, we've, we've raised sen several hundreds of millions of dollars each year for that charity, which is, I think, now more worthy than ever. And for the, because of the pandemic, we didn't have a big uh, charity this year. But fortunately, I called my friends, who are very wealthy and very uh, involved in philanthropy, and uh, we raised still over $200,000. So to me, it's, you got to give back. And I've been fortunate enough, not that I'm not rich, believe me, but I live well and I, I, I 
I try to do my part. Yes, and, and you, you do your part for sure. And I think that's so important. And so you've been very involved in helping with the St. Francis Food Pantry during this pandemic. And, and I mean, we've seen so much food insecurity. So this is really terrific. Now, you've recently written a book about your life. And I want you to talk a little bit about that book. What's the name of the book? How we can buy it? And, and what do you say? And what is your message in that book? My message in that book, I, I waited 75 years to write it because I had to wait because of my involvement with so many people. I didn't want to get anyone angry with me, but I wanted to tell the story. So uh, the book is out two years already. It's still a bestseller on Amazon. It's called Hollywood Godfather, My Life in the Movie and the Mob. The, it's in its sixth print. And I'm going to give you a news bulletin. Yesterday, I had a meeting with probably one of the most successful producers for television, Colin Wilson. He did Avatar. He has Mandalorian on TV right now for Disney. He just got nominated for 15 Emmy Awards. And he's agreed to not only be my showrunner, he's one of my producers. And I put a team together that your audience is going to recognize. I have uh, Nick Vallelongo, who created the pilot and the 10 hours that's being produced. Nick, was, Nick is known for Green Book. He won the Oscar for Best Picture and Best Screenplay. Another name in New Yorker that we all love, Chaz Palminteri. He's writing three episodes and directing them. And then an old friend of mine who I love, George Gallo, who has um, Midnight Run, 29th Street, all of those accolades. So that's my producing team and writing team. <laughs> It's like insane. They have nine Oscars and 28 Emmys, not including these 15 yet. So that just happened yesterday. We've been working on it, but now we're, we're greenlit and we're starting to make it happen. So. Well, that's very exciting. And I'm, I'm very, very happy for you. And so this will be a movie or will this be a ten series? Hour, ten hour mini series. But I have also I have a podcast that's got 113 hours. Now they want to option the podcast because the stories are ongoing. I mean, it's amazing. When I wrote the book, when we turned in the galleys, it could have been 500 pages, but I found out something new. I never wrote a book before. The, the publishers don't want a heavy book. They want a short book, keep your interest, and then write another one. But with that said, my book is still going. We've never gotten to the second one yet. It's still a bestseller. So with that said, here I am, blessed again. And, you know, it's uh, 70, 70, what was that? 70 years later when I started, you know, making these vows and all that, when I said I was seven, you know, six and a half, seven years old. So I'm pretty blessed. And uh, I will never stop helping people. And I just feel good about it. I don't do it for any other reason. I don't yell it around town. I'm not one of those people. But... Um, and I'm, I'm really even like with you having me on the show today, you're going to give me a whole new audience. And um, I think it's important. And I, I thank you for that. I really do. Now, Gianni, when you look back on your life, do you have any regrets? Not one. Not one hour. I love. And would you life. do it over again as you did? Exactly. exactly. I don't know if we can now with all the electronics and everything else. But, you know, it. Uh, what we know today, even, I mean... I'm blessed. I have 11 children. I have nine sons, two daughters, 10 grandsons. And I watch their intellect, even at three or four, they, they do some, these little palm pads and all these stuff. I can't even program my cell phone yet. But I mean, it's amazing what's going on. I don't know if it's good or not, because I don't see anybody, you know, communicating like we did, you know, to go to grandma's house on Sunday was a big occasion for us. They're not doing that anymore. The whole, this pandemic, I mean, this isolation is really, I think, messed up society throughout the world. For sure. This pandemic has created a lot of suffering for just about everyone. And, and I think children have really suffered. And children are, the, are the, usually silent about their suffering. And hopefully, moving forward, we'll, things will get much better and we'll all get through this. 
for our audience, we are with Gianni Russo. He's an actor, he's a singer, and he's best known for his role in The Godfather uh, many years ago, the um, movie that came out in 1972, which was a huge hit worldwide. And uh, Gianni, now getting back to you and your family life, I understand you've been married many times, you've had many different wives, and what advice do you I've give only, to I've someone? Only had, I've only had three wives, but 10 mothers to my kids. <laughs> I've so only had my boat. <laughs> a lot of relationships. Yeah. And are you close to your children and grandchildren? Not all of them. I mean, understand, and anybody who's been a divorcee or coming from a single family, their, their mothers raised them. I, so I have nine sons and one daughter. So those nine sons were raised by their mothers. And I'm sure she wasn't giving me accolades as a father, nor did I deserve them. I was out every night. I owned nightclubs and had a great life. I mean, I gave what I could and they all have educations and a roof over their head, but I wasn't there to hold their hand or, you know, put their fallen tooth under the pillow and put money under it. I, I, I wasn't a hands-on father. I am not. Yeah, but to me, you know, it's uh, being a father is more important than anything to me. And I've been a father to a lot of people other than my kids, which I get gratitude out of that. So, you know, it's, it's hard being who I am and trying to appease all these women. And if your children and, and grandchildren, if they're watching right now, what words would you have to say to them? Read the book. <laughs> read the book is what I would say to them the story the last chapter is dedicated to them and that's lovely and I'm sure you have a lot of love for your family and and getting back to you again your acting what was your favorite movie was it the godfather or was it a different movie no the godfather definitely was you know Definitely was my favorite movie. And look, it's coming out again, March 15, 2022, 50th anniversary, a new cut of it too. So it's going to be, you know, that. So well, that'll be around the corner movie. before you know it. Hopefully we'll all be able to go to movie theaters again. Please. Yes. Now your work as a philanthropist, which I find fascinating because when we think of someone like you, we may not think that they would be involved in philanthropy, but I find it important and also something that others can learn from and any kind of donation is greatly needed. And Gianni, I wanna thank you very much for all of your information. And what advice do you give to our viewers today, right now in 2021, as they move forward? Be kind. Be kind. That's all. Be kind to everybody you can. You never know when you're going to need the kindness for yourself. That's all. I mean, that's it. It's my life. And what's on the horizon for you? I know you have this. So many things. My clothing line, my food line. If you go to Corleone, uh, fine, fine, Corleone Fine Italian Foods, that's online already. Um, my, my La Cosa Mia by Gianni. There's so much going on my podcast. Everything is going on. But thank you. So thank you have you. a very full life, right? That's all I do, work. I love it. And I think that's very important for sure. And are you wearing anything that you're producing? This is all my stuff. The shirts, everything here is mine. Collars, jackets. You'll see it soon. So it's not on the market yet? No, it'll be on April 1st. Go to the website. Thank you, Gianni, for joining us. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. Our guest today, Gianni Russo. He's an actor, he's a singer, and he's best known for his role in The Godfather in 1972. Thank you all for joining Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. I'll see you next week.